This is the new Criterion. I'm James Pinero, executive editor, with a special edition of the podcast. From the new Criterion's Edmund Burke Award for Service to Culture and Society, we welcome and congratulate our 2019 recipient, Andrew Roberts. Thank you very much indeed, James. The Edmund Burke Award honors individuals who have made conspicuous contributions to the defense of civilization. Andrew, you have contributed to this defense, not just conspicuously, but joyfully. That's very kind of you. I greatly appreciate that. From your best-selling histories of the Second World War, through your history of the English-speaking people since 1900, and your life in Napoleon, on to your latest bestseller, Churchill Walking with Destiny, your astonishing books are a delight to read because you make communion with the great figures of our history. Just as Churchill walked with destiny, you write with destiny, including for the pages of The New Criterion. And it is an honor for all of us to join you here tonight. Well, I love The New Criterion. I think it's a uh, monthly infusion of, uh, of intelligence and common sense and wit, and uh, I love writing for it oh, as well. Oh, well, we love having you. And I should let our listeners and viewers know that when we last saw you some two months ago, you were just embarking on your American book tour for Churchill. Now here you are in the middle of it. What have you discovered along the way about America's affinity for Winston Churchill? Well, Americans love Churchill. Um, I think that they actually love Churchill more than the Britons do. Uh, Britons, my countrymen, tend to get uh, hung up on some completely trivial details of Churchill's career, um, and uh, especially things to do with industrial relations and uh, other, frankly, completely unimportant aspects of him, which, um, which you're not. You actually have have a perspective that is far more important. You look at the really big issues, uh, the way in which he, on three occasions, he got the most important things right during the 20th century with regard to Prussian militarism and the Nazis and the communists. And, uh, and so actually, if anything, I think uh, this side of the Atlantic has a much more healthy view of Churchill uh, even than on mine. From Napoleon through Churchill, you write what some may deride as great man stories of history. Well, whatever happened to the histories of great men? Why are such histories challenged today? Uh, because of Marxism and uh, the Whig view of history and the determinists. Uh, the idea that great individuals, not just men, of course, women as well, that made a real contribution, a changing contribution to history that has been derided by um, people who just want to see vast impersonal forces as the uh, driving forces of history. As soon as you actually look, though, at that closely, you realize, and especially, of course, in the case of Napoleon and indeed of Churchill, that it's complete tripe actually individuals are vital to history. In fact, history is only the collected experience of millions of individuals. Well, I want to ask about the particular challenge of writing a new history of Churchill. There are already some thousand books on the subject. Sir Martin Gilbert wrote Churchill's official eight-volume biography, and Churchill himself wrote some 37 books, 5,000 speeches, and a six-volume account of the Second World War, totaling nearly two million words, a story you tell in your introduction. He even won the Nobel Prize in Literature, and his parliamentary career spans some 63 years. How do you contend with such a record, and how do you look to add to this history? Well, it is a huge record, of course, partly because you can't take every word that Churchill uh, says about himself as, uh, as true. He tried to make himself to be uh, thicker than he was, in fact, in his autobiography, My Early Life. Very rare for politicians to uh, underplay their own intelligence, but Churchill did. Um, the second thing, of course, is that there have been a huge amount of new sources, new uh, areas of information that have become available. And uh, so I've uh, managed to mine all of those and make my book different from the 1009, in fact, that have come uh, before. So uh, I think there's still some space for saying something about Churchill that hasn't been said over and over again. Well, I gather from your acknowledgments that you had some special access that other historians have not had. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, I was very fortunate um, to be allowed to be the first Churchill biographer to uh, actually have access to Her Majesty the Queen's father's diaries 
King George VI met Winston Churchill every Tuesday of the Second World War. Uh, they had lunch together at Buckingham Palace, and uh, the King was trusted by Churchill with all of the great secrets of the Second World War, and luckily he wrote everything down. And so that's proved to be a great news source. But on top of that, there have been 41 sets of papers uh, that have been deposited at Churchill College archives since the last biography of Churchill. The Soviet ambassador's diaries are now available. I myself, a few years ago, found the verbatim accounts of the War Cabinet, and those have been tremendously helpful, as well as uh, the Churchill family allowing me to see some uh, documents and papers that haven't been seen by anyone else at all, including Churchill's daughter's 1940 diary. So um, there's something on pretty much every page of this book that's never appeared in a biography of Churchill ever before, and uh, that also, I think, makes this book uh, worthwhile. Well, you put us writers to shame because I understand you wrote your thousand-page biography and how long did it take you? Uh, it took me a hundred days. Um, I can write, it, yes, but it's an absurd thing and it's not very good for my health, I don't think. I start at 4 or 4.30 in the morning, uh, go through until lunchtime, and then I drink um, a can of Red Bull, which keeps me wired like this for uh, another uh, few hours. And uh, so I managed to write 5,000 words a day. And um, therefore, this whole book was written in a uh, in hundred days. Well, your book has been praised as exquisitely written by Comrade Black in our pages, and other outlets have called it surely the best single volume biography of Churchill yet written. What did you learn about Churchill's sense of destiny in writing this book? Well, I very much chose the subtitle, uh, Walking with Destiny, not just because uh, it sounds good. I've been told by an English friend that all Americans uh, are interested in destiny and all British people are interested in walking. Um, <laughs> but uh, I actually chose it, of course, because it mentions his great... Um, reference to the day that he became Prime Minister on the 10th of May 1940, in which he said, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And, uh, and that's an um, important aspect of Churchill, this sense, this driving sense of personal destiny that he had all his life, that he was going to save England and, uh, and save London. I noticed that a writer for The Guardian used your book to attack Churchill's, quote, racism and paternalism and, quote, vindictiveness influenced by his racist views. Last year, a retired American astronaut tweeted out a quote by Churchill and then felt the need to retract it after facing down an online firestorm. Quote, did not mean to offend by quoting Churchill, he wrote. My apologies. I will go and educate myself further on his atrocities, racist views, which I do not support. Well, Churchill lived much of his life under real attack, facing down both the Bolshies and the Huns, as he called them. Why is he virtually besieged today? Well, of course, I'm always delighted to be attacked by The Guardian. It's absolutely essential. If you're not attacked by The Guardian, you don't know that you're on the right track. But with regard to the... Um, accusations of racism. I think it really is uh, very important to remember that he was born in the same time that Charles Darwin was still alive. And people believed in, um, in a hierarchy of races in those days. And however much we know that to be ludicrous and obscene, they thought at the time that it was scientific fact. So uh, he's been attacked for that. I don't think that's uh, fair to attack somebody for something in that ahistorical way. But he's also been attacked for all sorts of other things, and many things of which he was guilty. This is not a hagiography. I, I do attack Churchill on uh, myself, on, on several of the mistakes, the blunders that he'd made in his life. But as he told his own wife, Clementine, from the trenches in 1916, I should have made nothing if I had not made mistakes. Yes. Mm. Tonight, you're delivering remarks on Churchill's debt to Burke. How much was Edmund Burke in the mind of Winston Churchill? A lot. Um, Churchill uh, admired Burke hugely. He read him widely. He quoted him. Um, and I think that uh, Burke's thought affected Churchill's um, beliefs as well um, in, a, in a profound way. It um, is not just luck that, uh, that Churchill again and again quotes from Edmund Burke. 
You are a writer, a reader, and a friend of the new Criterion. What in particular brings you to our pages? I think it's actually the fact that you are setting yourself athwart history um, in, uh, in uh, William F. Buckley's uh, famous phrase. And uh, that's a brave place to be. It really is. And uh, again and again, not just the quality of the writing, although, of course, that is always attractive, indeed a prerequisite for a successful magazine like yours, but also the, uh, the sheer moral courage that you show again and again in, uh, in setting yourself apart. And uh, that's something, that's a very Churchillian quality, moral courage. It's not quite the same thing as physical courage. Um, it's, uh, it's something that is vital if you are to keep uh, civilization on track. People have to absolutely be allowed to uh, speak what they see as the truth. And uh, the new criterion never backs down from that. You have been listening to and watching The New Criterion. From The New Criterion's Edmund Burke Award for Service to Culture and Society, we are joined by our 2019 recipient, Andrew Roberts. Andrew, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great honor.